need in the coming decades oil and gas as part of our energy mix. The Bank of England insists it has the economy under control after raising the base rate of interest for the 14th successive time. It now stands at 5.25%, the highest since 2008. Professor Danny Blanchflower, a former member of the Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee, told LBC it's to try to bring down inflation. What it does is it tanks the housing market and it tanks the economy because it scares everybody senseless and they stop spending on things and the economy slows. Thousands of jobs are at risk at Wilco as it warned plans to appoint administrators. The retailer says it's failed to secure enough investment to solve its cash flow issues. The company employs 12,000 people across 400 shops in the UK. And two-time champions Germany are out of the Women's World Cup after failing to beat South Korea. Both sides go home following a one-all draw with Morocco and Colombia progressing into the last 16 from Group H. In the city, the FTSE 100 has closed down 32 points at 75.29. The pound buys $1.27 and €1.16. LBC weather showers becoming increasingly confined to eastern parts of England and Scotland, drier elsewhere and a low of 8 degrees. Patchy cloud and sunny spells tomorrow, scattered and thundery showers mostly in the north and east, a high of 22 degrees. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Daryl Jackson. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with Ian Dale. Hello, a very good evening to you. It's uh, three minutes past eight on LBC. If you've just tuned in, welcome to the programme. Uh, maybe people tuning in on Global Player from Israel because we have the Israeli ambassador to London or to the Court of St. James, as I should properly put it. Uh, Zippy Hotovelli, Zippy, it's good to see you. Or I should say, Madam Ambassador, it's good to see you uh, again. Um, we're going to take calls from our listeners a little bit later in the hour. The number to call if you'd like to take part in the phone in is 0345 6060 973. But I'm I'm going to warm you up with a few questions first. Let's start off with anti-Semitism, because until probably about seven or eight years ago, I don't remember it being a real issue in this. I mean, obviously it existed, but it, it was never really in the headlines. And then it was. And I want to know whether you think in 2023 that it's starting to go out of the headlines and, and whether the people that needed to grip the problem have done so. First of all, good, e good evening. It's so nice to be here with you again. And I love coming here because the interaction with your audience. Uh, first of all, you mentioned anti-Semitism in the headlines. And I, I read the Times every morning. And in today's Times, you could see an article that I, I find really disturbing about the fact that there is a rise of anti-Semitism in the classroom. Like if you look at uh, young kids or kids in high school, you, they, they don't feel safe um, in the place where they're supposed to feel safe. So obviously it is a problem and it's a serious problem and I can say that the British government takes it very seriously and we work very closely with um, the government's envoys of to fight anti-Semitism but it's a matter of education before everything. So I think as, as long as we get to, to see the CSD report about rise of anti-Semitism, rise of incidents, and we read it also in the newspapers about the fact that kids feel more um, under anti-Semite you know, anti attacks and also in, in campuses, um, this is something we all should be concerned about, speak about, and to fight it. This is the only way to beat it. And, uh, of course, there are... Keir Starmer has been leader of the Labour Party now for three years. Um, he's made uh, a great effort to rid the Labour Party of anti-Semitic influence. Um, have you met with him? Do you think he's done enough? I met Keir Starmer when our president came here for the King's coronation and anti-Semitism was one of the issues being raised. And uh, it, it's clearly that um, in, in the public sphere he's doing a lot in order to fight an anti-Semitism. But I, I think we should see the broader picture, the fact that um, many people even don't understand that certain statements 
are under anti-Semitism, that it's racism against Jews. I think this is part of the problem. So um, I totally agree that sometimes, like um, the very famous book, Jews Don't Count, people don't understand that Jews have been suffering from racism because they are Jews for so many years. And uh, many, many people in this country can uh, give a testimony to the fact that modern anti-Semitism is still something need to be taught in the classroom. There, there is, but it does work both ways, doesn't it? Because, as I understand it, there is a law in Israel now that enables people to d decide not to serve non-Jews or not to serve LGBT people. Now, in a democracy, I mean, assuming that I've interpreted this law correctly, I mean, I find that completely reprehensible that an Israeli shopkeeper could say, well, you're not a Jew, I'm not going to serve you. Well, I must say that there is no such a law in the Israeli um a book and I must say that this was probably some well, kind a, of headline it's a, it's, being it's, twisted. It's a clause in the coalition agreement that was reached um, at the end of last year which will allow pri which allows private business owners to refuse services to Israelis based on religious beliefs meaning Israeli businesses will be able to legally deny services to non-Jews or indeed LGBTQ plus people. This is something that will never pass our Supreme Court, and I'm sure we'll speak a lot about the well, judicial we reform. A, we will in a moment. And what I can tell you, there is no legislation like that. So even if it was, you know, some, some people were thinking um, uh, that something like this, which is uh, totally outrageous, uh, but is something that is possible. But isn't this proposed by your finance minister, um, Bezalel el No, because it's not, again, let's make a strong division between opinions of people and between the law. Israel is a country of rule of law. Israel is a country that part of its values is equality. And every person should give service to every person in, in our country and beyond our country, we give service to tourists. Can you imagine Israel, by the way, not giving service to people that are non-Jewish that are coming you know, well, that's why I was really shocked by this proposal. It's, it's very strange, and I must say that uh, this is not part of our um, book of laws. So, what, what about gay people? Well, I'm very proud of the I fact that uh, the Speaker of our Parliament is a very proud uh, gay that brought his partner and his kids to uh, the first session of Parliament that he was leading. And uh, actually, Amir is, is a dear friend of mine. And I'm very proud of the fact he's the first Israeli gay speaker. And he was also the first justice minister that was a proud gay um, in, in this position. So I think it speaks for itself, the fact that one of the symbols of Israel, the speaker of our parliament, is publicly, uh, officially coming to uh, fight for the gay community uh, person that is you know, the representative of our parliament. But would you accept that over the past few years that gay people um, in Israel have felt a little bit under threat. I mean, Tel Aviv is always seen as a very modern European-style city and very gay-friendly, but certainly there, d there does seem to be a feeling that, that the gay rights agenda has gone back in Israel. Israel is the most vibrant democracy, as we love to say, and every person, every gender, every... Um, I, I really think that everyone should feel safe for their liberal values. And if, if someone is worried uh, what will happen with Israel's future, I'm here to guarantee Israel will always be a Jewish democratic country. And I truly believe that the liberal values are not under debate. Let, let's turn to the question of Palestine. And there's so many issues related to that that we could talk about. But let's, let's talk about the fact that more than 200 Palestinians are being killed this year in the occupied territories and in Gaza. Um, the majority of these have been recorded in the West Bank. At least 26 people have been killed in Palestinian attacks against Israelis during this time. Now, 2023 is already the deadliest year for Palestinians in the West Bank since uh, the United Nations began tracking these figures in 2005. What do you put that down to? Everything needs to have a context. And in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the context of the last year, if you're speaking about numbers, is that the Palestinian being killed, almost every single one of them, the majority of them, were terrorists. Terrorists that wanted Teenagers to... Teenagers as well. Uh, well, this is, this is something that I want to, just to be very clear about. 
the age of a person who's trying to kill you doesn't make him not a terrorist. So if someone is 16 years old, but unfortunately Hamas or the jihadic Islam is training him to kill innocent people, just like two days ago, people went to a burger place in Israel, in a, 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 new, a community next to Jerusalem, and six people were wounded, and the, the, the terror that, the, that they experienced was basically because there were Jews in Israel. That was, that was the idea behind it. Innocent people, uh, fire was open to them from a Palestinian terrorist. So what I'm trying to say, the fact that they are young people just makes us all to be concerned about the education with the Palestinian Authority. Why do they educate those young people to take a gun and to fire on innocent people? This is actually makes the, the question stronger. But if I'll go back to the numbers, the people that Israel is targeting are terrorists. The people the Palestinians are targeting are civilians. This is the major difference. And unfortunately, the Palestinian Authority lost control on some of the terror hubs, like just like Janine. And this makes Israeli IDF, Israeli forces, uh, work harder because they need now to get into places like Janine in order to prevent a future terror attacks. And, and this is what they're doing because the duty of every country is, first of all, to defend its people. And we had so many civilians that got killed from a Palestinian terror attack. So this is the context. But it, it does come to something when you have the head of the United Nations condemning Israel's use of what he called excessive force. Um, in the attacks on Palestine. He criticised Israel for preventing injured people from receiving medical care and humanitarian workers from reaching those in need. Um, that, that does nothing for the image of Israel, does it? I think the facts on the ground are that Israel is fighting brutal and very, very hard, in very hard places, terror organizations that don't care about human life, don't care about human rights. They are the ones that are violating human rights time after time by using their own civilians, their own even young children as human shields. And this is the main problem. And when it comes to Israel, we are a country that cares about human life, that we care about every single individual. We don't want any loss of life But your, but your opponents would, would contest that. They would say that your, your, your attacks are too indiscriminate, that they're not as targeted as, as your government says they are. And therefore, you can be accused of breaking international law. And I mean, to be criticised by the head of the United Nations, I mean, it, it, as I say, it, it cannot be good for Israel's international reputation for that to happen. And I'm saying again, uh, when, when I check, when, when I do a fact check to every time Israel goes to a military operation, we make sure, and, and uh, actually our former uh, chief, chief of staff in IDF came to give a speech and he said, Every single uh, army, when you compare, when, when he's fighting a uh, very high populated area and when you, you see the collateral damage, um, Israel definitely has the fewest people that are um, under uh, Israeli fire because we target terrorists, we don't target civilians. And we really try our best and we danger our own soldiers in order to make sure that from the other side we won't have casualties that are innocent people. So I can stand behind those words. Israel is doing everything to prevent loss of innocent life and we're targeting terrorists and unfortunately on the other side we have radicals that are educating their kids, inciting their kids. But and don't, another but don't thing, you think another thing, some, some of your actions are radicalizing these people as well? You, you, you are creating, well maybe you might say that well, the, the enemies are already there but some of, the, some of the actions of your government, of your armed forces, surely lead to more radicalization in Gaza and now in the West Bank as well. Ian, you, you are blaming the victim because uh, Israel under Palestinian terrorism is a victim of a very, very hard, violent attack. And, and if we'll go back to where Israel is... Um, designing the future of the Middle East. Think about how many peace agreements Israel signed just in the last two years. We had the Abraham Accords, four incredible peace agreements with Arab countries that are really creating new uh, era in the Middle East. So it means Israel always wants peace. Israel wants to achieve peace with all its neighbors. So when we think about the future, we need to ask ourselves questions like, and by the way, I don't get to hear enough journalists are asking these questions. How come the Palestinian Authority, 10% from its budget, is still going to pay salaries to terrorists and terrorist families? It's called this formula of pay I, for slaves. I have pay asked that question to I the know, Palestinian but, ambassador in London. But and unfortunately, I will do again. not too many are asking that. Not too many are asking what kind of educational system creating terrorists that are teenagers, just like you said and you mentioned. And 
this is the real question. The real question, why the Palestinian Authority still pays and glorifies terrorists. This is, this is what we should I mean, be asking. Ro- Robert on Alexa has got a, a message here. He says, if you got out of Palestine, the fighting will stop. Now, that may seem very simplistic, but that, there, there's a kind of truth to it, isn't there? So let's, let's uh, remember what happened in 2005. 2005, Israel made a very hard decision to uh, withdraw to the international border in the Gaza Strip and all the Jewish communities, all the Jewish settlements were uh, taking off. People basically lost their houses and we said we're willing to do that for a future peace. What happened eventually? Did we get peace? No, actually Hamas took over. We got rockets on the middle of Israel. It made me as a mother for a young kid go into a shelter in a city that is 15 minutes away from Tel Aviv. This is my hometown. And this is the reality we we face. So it's about time we'll we'll face it. Peace will happen only when both sides are interested. And the Israeli side is always there, interested in peace. We need to see the other side comes and wants to have peace as well. Now, whenever I interview anybody from Israel, um, after the program, people say, why didn't you ask that? Or you weren't hard enough on her, you didn't go for her. Well, we are going to take calls. So if you think I'm asking the wrong questions, it's up to you. You can ask whatever questions you like. But I'm, I do want to talk about the judici- judicial reforms that have been so controversial. We'll come on to that in just a moment. It's 17 minutes past eight. LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. We have Zippy Hotavelli taking your calls in a moment. She's the Israeli ambassador to the UK. Um, as I say, I want to talk about the judicial reforms in just a moment, which have caused such a, a large amount of protests in Israel over the last few months. But um, just before I do that, though, let me ask you about the relationship between the United Kingdom and Israel, because, I mean, it's had its ups and downs over the years, but generally is quite friendly. But what... I mean, people think of the role of an ambassador as being quite glamorous and sort of lots of Ferrero Rocher receptions and all that sort of thing. But when you meet with not just politicians, but maybe business leaders as well, uh, what, 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 do you, what do you think? Uh, I mean, has, has the relationship become deeper over the years or um, has it be, become a little bit more difficult? Thank you for asking that, because I think many people don't know how close the relationship are on security and intelligence. And the UK is in the front line of being our ally when it comes to security and 
intelligence sharing in the same line with the United States. And just two weeks ago, we had an incredible security dialogue uh, led by our t- both national security advisors in Jerusalem. And we're going to have a second round in London. And our prime minister came and he said in the very clear voice uh, that, that our prime minister is using, he said, you are probably our best friend. And, and we, we appreciate the British sharing of knowledge. Now, obviously, we are very close to the, our American friends, but it is important to understand that we are today as close when it comes to security and intelligence sharing with um, the British uh, agencies and the British government. Um, if we'll carry on to the second pillar that every diplomatic relationship have is trade. And Israel, just like the UK, is... Um, services-based economy because of our technology and our high-tech. And we just finished the third round of a new trade deal that is going to be based on services. This is something very new and very modern, and I really hope to accomplish that uh, during long, my How time. long is that going to take, do you think? So I hope it will be accomplished in a year or so. And all I can tell you, both sides are very ambitious and they really want to accomplish that so both our economies can benefit from that. And another thing they want to mention is the AI revolution. So AI is one of the third three pillars of Israel's policy at the moment to invest in AI and to make sure Israel will be there when this revolution is is happening. And I know the UK is going to have a very big conference in November about AI and we are going to cooperate on this frontline issue that uh, probably they're going to replace us with robots soon, uh, Ian. Uh, so be, be careful. You may be, me never. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, let's let's move on to the judicial reforms because I, I think that th- these reforms, as you well know, have caused huge anxiety and protests in Israel. Um, Do you think it's all been worth the candle given the protests that again have brought your country into disrepute all over the world? First of all, I totally respect the people that go with the Israeli flag to the streets and uh, want to express what they think about the judicial reform. I think this is how democracy looks like. And if I want to be really honest, I have a sympathy to that because I used to be one of those people going with Israeli flags on other very, very vocal public so debates. What, what were you demonstrating So about? I, I was demonstrating as a high school kid against the Oslo Accords because um, I was part of the group that thought it won't bring, bring enough security. Uh, I remember myself standing in big Israeli uh, human chains against the disengagement as a high school kid and later on when I was in university. So for me, going to the street is part of expressing um, my views on what's happening in the government. And this is part of our DNA as a democracy. But you're right. It is something that is, um, in a way, creating massive division inside of Israeli society. And we are worried about it. I cannot sit here and say in London things look calm. No, it doesn't. And Has it surprised you the level of opposition? I think that maybe maybe for the people who are listening and say, what is this whole fuss all about? So let me just explain a bit, because uh, I think many people don't know what people are demonstrating about. And it is important to mention that most Israelis will agree that we need to have a reform in order to restore the balance between judiciary and legislator, those two branches. Uh, this is a debate that's going on for over a generation years. So when I was in law school, it was already a debate in Israel whether the judiciary is taking uh, authorities were never being given by the Israeli system. The Israeli system is very similar to the UK uh, in the aspect of the fact we are both very vi- vibrant democracies that doesn't have constitution and we still believe we have strong checks and balances and the courts is, are strong and we are uh, countries that deeply respect the rule of law. Uh, but when it comes to the judicial reform, the question is how, to what extent, and the question is what what is the right formula. And I think the Prime Minister at the moment is trying to create uh, more of a consensus kind of move. Really? It doesn't seem that way from where I'm sitting. So this is what he said. I think he gave like four interviews to the American television in the last few weeks and uh, I've been listening to most of his interviews and he's been saying that he would like to achieve all the judicial reform with a broader consent inside Israeli um, society. And I think... But why didn't he do that earlier idea. then? He tried. For the last really? three months, uh, there was uh, ongoing dialogue um, in the president's house in Israel. So it's not like we, the, the government didn't try. But it is important, I think, maybe the, the, the most important message is 
it's a legitimate debate between two sides that want to make Israeli democracy stronger. So it's not between But people how, want to uh, undermine Israeli it, democracy. How do you make it stronger when you eliminate the so-called uh, Wednesday uh, reasonableness clause, which effectively the Supreme Court can veto a government decision if they find it unreasonable? Now, that's the sort of check and balance that you find in most constitutions. Now, as, as you say, Israel and Britain don't have written constitutions. Right. But that means that it leaves the government with no judicial scrutiny of appointments, absolutely none. Just, uh, actually, I'm using now my power as a, as a former jurist. I mean, this is my profession. This is absolutely not a good description of the Israeli system. The Israeli system has many, many checks and balances. So the reasonable clause is something that is new in our system. So everyone is under the rule of law, of law including the judges. The judges are not above the law. So when you have... Um, let's say, a government decision that is illegal or is under a conflict of interest or anything else that uh, is, is it did, did something that is not unlegitimate. The Supreme Court has 100% authority and ability to say this is wrong because according to the law, you shouldn't do it. But when you're making something according to a standard that is not written, a standard that is in a way very, very flexible and very subjective, like reasonableness, you end up with not having something that people can understand what the law says, what the law doesn't say. And this was, was uh, this whole concept of reasonableness in our system. And I think many people felt that this is not the well, proper way of no, interpreting well, the, pr the prime minister felt that, didn't he? I mean, quite clearly. But I, I, again, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't remember seeing any groundswell of public opinion in Israel protesting that this was an outrageous uh, part of the, the Supreme Court uh, actions. I mean, the, it's the prime minister that has driven this. And we can see why, can't we? Going back to the academic debate around it. So for many years, many people said this is not the way courts should interpret law when you don't have a constitution. So I think actually today, more, most, most of the people will say the reasonable clause was too wide. And we need to make sure that everyone understand the, the language of the law and want understand what you can and you cannot do. And I think it actually makes the law clear, more clear. And to politicians, okay. uh, well, the boundary well, is very well, clear. Well, let's be clear. Who can scrutinize government appointments now? Definitely the, the Supreme Court. And it's not really? like it can't. Yes, of course. I mean, even after this reasonableness, uh, there are still parameters when some kind of decision is, is not under. Uh, but we have a standard for everything. And when it's not under those standards, it can still criticize it. So who, who would be able to stop your prime minister from bringing a convicted tax felon back as minister of the interior, which the court ruled illegal? And he says he's going to do. So I'm saying again, the Supreme Court will have lots of checks on the Israeli system. So, th so they could stop that, could they? They, could st they can stop many things. And actually what I think we're missing in the uh, judicial reform debate is the fact that many Israelis have felt for the last 20-something years that in a way the parliament lost its power because the judiciary almost replaced parliament. And I think in every democratic system, you should have a good balance. And we had lots of checks, we didn't have the balance. So but, I think but, they're trying to restore the balance but at the moment. But you've got a lot of people who are protesting on the streets of all, all Israeli cities, even probably tonight for all, for all I know. You, you've had 10,000 Israeli Defense Force reservists saying they uh, will suspend their voluntary duty in protest at these reforms. You've got middle class people who've probably never been on a protest in their lives before because they feel so strongly about this. And yet you try to tell me that the, that the Prime Minister is seeking consensus. That doesn't add up. I'm saying again, this is, um, the, in my opinion, uh, the right way in democracy when you want to express what you think about government decisions is to be vocal about it. So I think this is actually how democracy looks, not us. Fine. But, but you've got a Prime Minister who is about to be on trial for on corruption charges, talking about sort of the legal system. Now, a lot of people suspect that this is all about getting him off these charges in the end. Well, in order to understand our system, the three judges being appointed to be his judges to the court has nothing to do to changing 
uh, and, and making this reform because eventually those judges being elected already, being selected already, and they are. Uh, I, I don't want to discuss now Netanyahu's uh, trial because this is again a legal process being going Fine. on. But, 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 you but, but affect again, it. you see the optics of it, don't you? I mean, from from the outside. I mean, if it was in this country, he wouldn't be prime minister because you could not be prime minister on these kind of charges. I know you're a close political ally of his, and I don't expect you to get into the legal aspect of it. But again, from the optics point of view, it doesn't show Israel in a good light. I think uh, from the optic point of view, it's important to understand that according to Israeli law, the legal procedure should finish till we know uh, what exactly are the charges uh, of any prime minister. And we had prime ministers in the past going through this kind of process. And it's important to remember that uh, at the moment, there is a government in Israel that wants to have more uh, wide consensus agreement um, and move forward with that. And I, th- I truly believe that the prime minister is interested in a wide consensus around the reform. And, and we need to listen also to the people. I mean, uh, everyone thinking about the one side is coming to be against the reform. We forget the massive demonstration that was just lately, to support the reform. So it, it's it's not like it's one-sided. There are people that are supporting the reform. There are people are against the reform. And altogether, I think the majority of Israelis understand that some kind of reform should happen because the courts in the last 20-something years were becoming superpowers. And okay. we need to have the balance. Well, you might want to ask questions further on that subject or indeed anything else. We're going to come to your questions in just a couple of minutes' time. It's 8.31. Let's get the news headlines with Daryl Jackson. Donald Trump's expected to end enter a not guilty plea when he answers charges that he worked to overturn the presidential election in 2020. The former US president arrived at the courthouse in Washington to face four counts, including conspiracy to defraud the US government. The Bank of England's put more pressure on mortgage holders. They put interest rates up to 5.25% to try and control inflation. And 12,000 jobs are under threat at homeware store Wilco. The company says it intends to appoint administrators. LBC weather showers becoming increasingly confined to eastern parts of England and Scotland, drier elsewhere and a low of 8 degrees. LBC. Send a comment to LBC. 
It's 8.34. You're listening to Ian Dale. I'm with Zippy Hotovelli, the ambassador from Israel to the UK, and she's about to take your calls. This is where I stand back a little bit, I hope anyway, so you can put your questions to the ambassador and we'll try and get fit in as many as we can between now and nine o'clock. And don't forget, if you're not watching us on Global Player, uh, I think you should switch us on because we're both fine-looking people. <laughs> Chris is in Richmond. Hello, Chris. Hello there. Um, my question to you is, given that can Israel really call itself a democracy given that you've made it almost impossible to get rid of your current prime minister how, how do you why do you say that you mean because of these judicial reforms or because of the yeah, electoral yeah, yeah, system or what well the, the, the judicial reforms would basically mean that you know i think it's only medical or mental incapacity <laughs> what i read five minutes ago that is basically very very difficult now to get rid of mr netanyahu from office despite all the charges against him and obviously i'm not going to comment whether it's a right or wrong because that's a court of law to judge but it's clearly makes it very, very difficult, doesn't it? Hi, Chris. Uh, good evening. Um, Hello. Well, I'm, I've been ambassador here for the last three years and I served under three different Israeli governments and actually just uh, less than a year ago, there was uh, two different Israeli prime ministers. So the people of Israel can you definitely... You haven't quite beaten our record. <laughs> uh, it's true. <laughs> But I'm going back to uh, how dem- how democracies choose their leader. So uh, during the last election, Netanyahu was re-elected, but during the former election, Netanyahu was not elected and was the head of opposition. So uh, I think in democracies, you don't get rid of leaders; they either lose or win election. And, and according to Israeli law, he won election, and according to Israeli public, he was the one that got the majority of voters. And and this is this is how our democracy works. And uh, I think sometimes people... No, but, but Chris's point is that yes. these laws make it more difficult to get rid of the prime minister. And I, I, would, I would like again to uh, go back to the basic rule of democracy. We have election and Israel will have election in three years time. And in this three years time, people will go and vote whether against Netanyahu or for Netanyahu. Uh, But the most important thing is none of this legislation is speaking about any change of the structure of our political structure that will make it easier or harder to change the political uh, actors at the moment. So my feeling is probably our system is not, uh, we don't explain it well. So, 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 so when a newspaper article from someone in Jerusalem says what I've just said five minutes ago, are you going to take action again against them for, for misleading people? It is very clear what your, what your reforms are doing. You're making it basically very easy for him to get off the hook. So and it's your argument that, well, we can, the voters can vote on it in three years' time, even if he's acute, actually convicted of bribery and corruption or embezzlement or whatever it is. It doesn't matter. He could even be conserving, serving youth in prison. I mean, where does the line stop? Uh, I struggle with, li- with your argument. No, no, no election. problem. I will tell you where the line uh, the line stops. Um, the Israeli legislation is very clear. According to the law, if you are being charged of taking bribery or different other, um, uh, you know, things that are not allowed to do when you're in power you cannot be in office. And at the moment, there is still a legal process. You need to wait in patient till the judges will do what they need to do. But he has do. been charged. No, no, you need to be accused. I'm sorry. You right, need to, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, after you've been charged, you need the, the so legal if, process. If he's, if he's convicted. Convicted, yes. Because in America, the president, you can elect a president who, who's in a prison cell, in theory. I mean, who knows what, if that might happen. I'm sorry. Thank soon. you for that, Ian. So if you're convicted, and at the moment, there is a legal process and we need to respect that. So, so, the, so the process, let's be absolutely 100% percent clear from Chris's point of view if he was convicted of any of these offences it he would automatically forfeit office yes exactly okay and and this is why I, I'm saying again the reform has nothing to do to the charges of Netanyahu Let, Chris thank you let's go to David in Hampstead hello David hi hi Ian I'm my ambassador um, so my question is um, in light of what happened to um, you ambassador in when you went to LSE not all that long ago unfortunately um, and sort of the Corbynism movement, um, many would argue, spurred that on. With Keir Starmer potentially being our next prime minister, but also being someone who, along with you know his whole shadow cabinet, tried to get Jeremy Corbyn elected and sat very happily alongside Jeremy Corbyn, how does that, in your opinion, kind of affect things? And when it comes to anti-Semitism moving forward, how, how does that affect you know how, how that's treated and how you may view that? 
So I'll divide the answer to two um, different, uh, I think it's two different questions, basically. One is the attack in LSC, it was by pro-Palestinians, people that didn't want the Israeli ambassador to speak in campus. And this is where uh, the answer of the British government was very clear. We allow every every person to speak in campus and we want to make sure you'll be protected. And I went and spoke in different campuses throughout my uh, ambassadorial years. But the second question is more important, is about the future of, of uh, political leadership in Labour. And as ambassador, I don't take position on political things here in this country. And all I can tell you, we work very hard to make sure that Israel is something that is important. The alliance between the UK and Israel is beyond politics, is beyond different parties. We used to have close friends uh, under Labour with Tony Blair. I think Tony Blair is still a uh, close friend with Netanyahu. And uh, it has nothing to do to this party or another. Israel is a strong uh, partner and friend of the UK. And we want it to remain no matter who's in power. This is as diplomatic as I can be. <laughs> well, and it's inter- how, how have you found, just to in, in, interrupt a second, you were a politician, you were a minister for many in, years, in Israel yeah. for many years. How have you found that transition from partisan politician to the world of diplomacy? Well, I found it very, um, very good because I wake up in the morning and think how to do good things for my country and I represent whole Israel, not just a sector. So I actually very much enjoy Didn't you do that when you were a politician? When you're a politician, you're still um, under a party. So a party will always represent the sector, not Mm. the entire country, as much as the interest of the whole country is in the heart of all politicians. In the end, you uh, represent certain ideology. David, thank you. Uh, Stephen's in Basildon. Hi, Stephen. Hello, Ian. Fantastic show, as always. Thank you. Um, Hello. Uh, Good evening to the ambassador. I've got a question for you. Um, I'm a Jewish man, Okay. I've never been to Israel. My family have been in this country for hundreds of years, fought in all the world wars. So I don't I class myself as British first. Religion is not really a problem. However, when will your government understand, when will your government realise the damage that it does to every single Jew overseas in countries that are not in Israel, other than Israel? Jews around the world suffer because of that right, insular right-wing government you've got, okay, the damage you do to Palestinian people who are now, you know, I have sympathy for them. And the way you treat them is wrong. Very, very wrong. And you can talk about the rockets, you can talk about whatever you want, but ultimately you've brought this on yourselves. It's all been brought on by yourselves. And okay. there is absolutely no care there for anyone else around the world who happens to be Jewish and has to take the brunt, the results, pay the bill for what your right-wing government does. That's uh, my question. That's quite an, that's quite an accusation. Ambassador. No, but I can answer that. I can answer that. Stephen, I think I understand where you're coming from. And the truth is, it has nothing to do to our right-wing government because six different Israeli governments tried to achieve agreement with the Palestinians. They all failed. So we had Ehud Barak, left-wing leader. We had Ehud Olmert, who was willing to divide Jerusalem and even to give up the Western Wall. We had so many other governments, just like the former one with Naftali Bennett and Yair Lapid. They were willing to negotiate with the Palestinians as a liberal government, and the Palestinians never came and never were willing even to speak to them. So this is the reality. The reality is different Israeli governments try to achieve peace with the Palestinians, but the leadership of the Palestinians refused time after time either to negotiate or to make a deal. And it's important because sometimes people forget that it hasn't been a right-wing government all the time, actually. Um, if we go back 30 years, it was quite balanced between left and right in our democracy. So we had right-wing governments, we had center governments, we had even unity governments. So they all failed to achieve that. So if you, you repeat on, on something and you try again and again, and different political actors and different governments fail to achieve, you need to ask yourself, what about the Palestinians to come and to sit and negotiate and to be willing to have peace with the Israelis. This is, this is, I think, what is missing from the discourse. Well, let's add something into Stephen's question. Stephen, thank you for that. Omar has texted this. Yes. Can you please ask the ambassador, why does Israel continue with its suppression and in- inhumane treatment of Palestinians? Can Israel 
justify its continuously expanding illegal settlements within Palestinian territories. And I think that that last bit is kind of what Stephen was referring to, in that they are illegal settlements, and yet they're actually being encouraged by by people who are within the Netanyahu government. I'm so happy you're asking about settlements. So the settlements. You sure? Yes, because the settlements are based. Uh, basically, some people think Jerusalem even is a settlement. So Jerusalem. The Golan Heights, Judea and Samaria, there are no places in the world that Jews are connected more to these places. They're more connected there to Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv is a modern city. Judea and Samaria are places where Jews lived 3,000 years. So we're talking about places that Jews always used to live. And they take 3% of all this land under debate and under conflict. So let's let's make also um, check with reality. When Israel withdrew from the West, uh, when Israel withdrew from Gaza Strip, when Israel took off all those settlements, did we achieve peace? The answer was no. So settlements were never obstacle to peace. And in terms of the legal duty, so we feel very much connected to Judea and Samaria. According to the international law, there is a debate whether Israel can build settlements or not. But we definitely, all Israeli governments agree that no place Jews are more connected than Judea and Samaria. Well, fair enough, but... Uh, settlements continue to be built on the West Bank. Um, there are UN resolutions which you continue to defy on this. And um, previous Israeli governments have respected the, the UN resolutions and international law on this, but this government doesn't. I think this is a, a, a bit of misunderstanding because I've seen Israel gov- Israeli governments throughout the last 20 years, they all, had, they all had the same policy. We want to achieve peace with the Palestinians, all the Jewish so you just provoke them by building new settlements? We don't, because this is not the obstacle. Because if this was the obstacle, we would have achieved better life from both well, sides Well, there are lots of obstacles, we and, but this is an important one. And, and if, if, if Netanyahu tomorrow committed not to build more settlements, and I mean, maybe had a law which the Supreme Court would endorse, um, he says cheekily, um, that might be a, a sign to the Palestinians of the intent of the Israeli so, government to want so genuine Ian, peace. Let's, let's have a, even a short memory. Just lately, just less than a year, we had a government that didn't said settlements will be its thing. Did we see the Palestinians coming to negotiate? Did we see the terrorism stop? No, this is the real obstacle to peace. The real obstacle to peace is the fact there is still terror actions against Israelis, that Israelis are saying, wait a second, if we removed all the settlements from the Gaza Strip and all we got is more rockets, more terror, more violence, then what exactly the Palestinians okay. want? So definitely the, I can say that those settlements are not the obstacle and Jews are connected to Judea and Samaria. So I think under Israeli governments, Everyone will say Jews can live in Judea and Samaria. Right. We will be taking more of your questions in just a moment. It's 8.47. LBC.
Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. If you're watching on Global Player, you will know that Zippy Hotavelli is with me, the Israeli ambassador to the UK. She's taking your calls. Uh, Michelle is in Israel, and I think she's in your home... For my extensive research, I think she's calling from your hometown, which I'm not going to pronounce right, Rehovot. Rehovot. Michelle, hello, welcome, go ahead. Good evening, Madam Ambassador. Greetings from Rehovot. It's so nice to get some uh, <laughs> warm regards from my hometown. Makes you feel like home, <laughs> I, I feel like home. Yeah. <laughs> Go on, um, Michelle. Yeah, uh, you alluded earlier on to Israel's contribution to AI, and this is what my question is about. Um, it was recently, a few months ago, in the news about uh, Netanyahu speaking to Elon Musk about. Uh, Israel and AI and and how Israel can contribute. Uh, it would seem that it, AI can be an incredible thing. My my daughter uses it every day in research at the Weizmann Institute. Um, but also there has been spoken about a global crisis regarding AI. We could see the rise of an AI army, for, for instance. Need your question, could Michelle? You, yes. Could could you tell us? Um, further about Israel's contribution to AI and how Israel is going to combat the global crisis with AI. So one of the great things about um, what you mentioned is the fact it has challenges, risks and benefits. Like every new technology, but this this is really something that global democracies should get together. And this is why I think the conference at the UK is um, is leading on this is so important. We need to have like-minded countries that care about human rights, care about democracy, care about all those liberal values we all stand for, be together when we speak about how to use this technology. Because as you said, there are so many aspects to that. So I, I want to mention the fact that when the government makes it a priority and when the British government is also making it a priority, this is exactly a field where we can have a cooperation between our two great democracies, our two great countries. So. Israel brings to the table technology, many uh, companies from the private market that are leading on the AI field, but we need to work together on questions about the future of AI, uh, AI in education, AI in medicine, AI, as you said, in the security field. So there are so many aspects of that. Um, just like a few years ago, cyber technology was a buzzword uh, leaded by the Israeli Prime Minister. Again, it was Netanyahu that said this is one of the top fields that Israel should bring its expertise coming from the Israeli um, defense forces and our technology defense-based companies. It's it's another one of those things that will change the world. So okay. I, tru- I truly believe that Israel has so much to give. Michelle, thank you. Let's go to Clive in Miami. Clive, hello. Hi. The ambassador says there can only be peace when both sides want peace and that Israel always wants peace. My question is, what would be a more effective peace? A two-state solution or granting Palestinians full Israeli citizenship? So this is a question that you could ask Tipi, the politician. Um, Because you're asking Tipi, the ambassador, I can only tell you the government's policy. So the government's policy at the moment is that in order to achieve peace, um, there are a few obstacles. The, one, the first obstacle is the fact the leadership of the Palestinian is divided at the moment. So let's say you want to have a deal with the Palestinian Authority uh, that you can't have the one that sits in Gaza in, with Hamas. So to, to begin with, you need to have leadership in the other side that is legitimate, that is not under so many years of not having internal election. Uh, the fact that you have so many other alternative groups happening in, in the Palestinian, like the jihadic Islam getting stronger, this Iranian support, I think we've been talking almost for an hour, I didn't mention Iran. So Iran is probably the biggest threat to, to the region and also uh, to Western democracies. And we need to mention the fact Iran is one of the biggest influencers in our region. And it's a big danger. So we need to make sure that, first of all, Palestinian leadership is united and not divided. The second thing is education. Whether uh, we will have leadership that is willing to speak to Israel is, depends also on the mindset. of. Uh, just like we, we've seen other Arab countries saying Israel is actually a friend and asset, not an obstacle in our region. 
uh, this should be the mindset also from the Palestinian but, but side. But Clive's question with respect was, uh, what would be a more effective peace, the t- two-state solution or granting Palestinians But I'm saying again, I cannot, as, as a diplomat, I cannot give you, I can just give you the but policy. It, the is, policy of the government is... But is it still, I mean, is there a, a willingness to consider a two-state solution? Because I know what Zippy, the politician, would say I to I know, this. but this is, this is why I, I'm not in the politician chair. No. And at the moment, I can just say on behalf of the Israeli government... We want to achieve peace, but we know at the moment the Palestinians are still in a point where they cannot deliver and they're not willing even to sit in negotiation. But what is the Astro- Israeli government position the, on a two-state pos- solution? I think the, the position is it. Uh, it's at the moment we're so far from that because in order to achieve any solution, you definitely need to have direct negotiation. And at the moment, there is no leadership on the other side that can even willing that is even willing to negotiate with the Israeli side. I mean, I'm reading into that that the Israeli government has effectively given up on a two-state solution. I'm sure if you would have interviewed a Palestinian um, um, uh, ambassador, you would have said, uh, as he said, I think, publicly many times, he's not interested in the two-state solution. Mm. So you need to understand that, also well, that, that is from true. the Palestinian side, it was said so many times that they are not interested. And uh, th- I, By the way, personally, if you ask me something I can say as a diplomat, I truly believe the future will lead us to very creative solutions. And the most important thing behind it will be the willingness of the two people to live with each other. I think everyone needs to re-watch the episode of The West Wing where President Bartlett brings about a, a, a solution between the Israelis and the Palestinians all within the, all within 60 minutes. I if, didn't if, watch it. I should. Oh, you know, you I watched should. The Diplomat, which uh, was uh, the uh, Netflix well, show. Yeah. Well, this, this is, it's, it was quite something, this episode. Do, do, was I it can't, realistic? I can't... Well... It's slightly idealistic, but it, it's it's worth a watch. Um, right, Catherine uh, is in Muswell Hill. Hello, Catherine. Hello, Ian. Um, I'd like to ask you, Ambassador, um, specifically about the judicial reforms. Many, as you've pointed out yourself and been questioned by Ian, many Israelis, Jews and non-Jews, really fear that Israel is tipping towards theocracy rather than democracy. And that's a concern that many of us around the world share. What are your views on that. I, I fear that in a lot of the questions you've been asked and that you've answered them, you're minimising that concern. You're saying, oh, it's very healthy to see people demonstrating on the street. Well, why are they demonstrating? Why are commentators, historians, um, political commentators around the world voicing that concern specifically towards an, a, an a extreme fundamentalist religious shift in how in, in how Israel is governed. And it is tipping towards a theocracy. First of all, thank you for uh, being so uh, honest with your concerns. I think it's important to listen to concerns and not to say, well, you have nothing to worry about without you know, bringing something to the table. So what I can tell you that this government is led by Likud. And as you know, the Likud is, uh, is a party that is liberal party, is a secular party. It's not religious party in any way. The but it's got into bed with many religious parties, but, which people in this country look at what they stand for and find them very objectionable. But still, in Israel, I mean, your country is, is, is not used to coalition governments. And we are used to because this is our system. And when you have a coalition government, you still have the ruling party and the ruling party makes the tone. And this judicial reform, and I think this is the most important statement that you can take from me this evening, is being needed by secular people that want to have more balance between judiciary and legislator. It's not needed by religious people. It's not needed by the religious parties. It's needed inside the Likud with a justice minister who's as secular as you can believe someone is, can be secular. And, and the reason he's doing that is because many people in Israel, secular and religious, people from the left wing, by the way, many Labour Party leaders used to think we need to have more balance. The president of Israel himself, he said, majority of Israelis will agree that some reform should happen and we need to have more balance between judiciary and legislators. So this is something that has nothing to do to religious values. This is something that has something to do to the balance in democracy, to creating the right checks and balances between the different branches. And I think this is a legitimate debate and nothing of, of you know, nothing that will happen in the future will make Israel less of a democracy, but actually it will make it a stronger democracy. We've run out of time. Shall we finish off with a very yes. uncontroversial question? Please. In your three years in the United Kingdom, what's been the best place you've visited that you've enjoyed most? 
Well, now I have a different answer than I had three years ago. Three year, okay, I will say both. So three years ago, I spent a summer in the Scottish Highlands. It was just magical. But just lately, we went to Cornwall. And probably one of my favourite places in the world will be Tintagel Castle mm. because I love King Arthur's legends. and Because you do get around the country quite a lot in I your job, do, don't you? I it's, try. Not, it's not just London. I try more. I mean, I should I should be travelling more, but I think I think the countryside is beautiful. Well, all I can say is come to Norfolk. It, 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 it's even nicer than Cornwall. I'll take your recommendation, <laughs> Ian. Uh, I'll visit Norfolk. Next time we'll Fine. meet, I'll tell you how it Marvellous. Uh, Zibi Otavelli, thank you for joining us. Uh, if you hadn't worked it out already, she is, is Israeli ambassador to the UK. Now, keep your calls coming. Um, the ambassador is leaving us now, but I want to spend the next hour talking about Israel and, and really digging into some of the issues that we've talked about with the ambassador over the last hour uh, and maybe get some more of your views on the ju judicial reforms, the likelihood of any kind of peace talks taking place over the next couple of years. Um, maybe, I mean, what, what is the American role in this now under President Biden? I mean, there were things that actually were happening under President Trump. What if he comes back into the White House? And of course, big news in the next hour is that, he, that Donald Trump is actually appearing before a court. And we're going to bring you the latest on that as well. But more of your calls on Israel and Palestine coming up in just a moment. 0345 6060 973. On your radio, on Global Player, and Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation, this is LBC. From Global's newsroom. Four minutes past nine on LBC. Uh, we've just spent the last hour with the Israeli ambassador, and I know from past experience that whenever 